Tom, you're back. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, happy to be here. And Luca, nice to see you. Okay, so since we started recording and uh, while we're waiting for a few more people, um, I can briefly introduce the um, Community Engagement Forum, who's hosting this uh, community coffee and chat, um, um, especially to your newcomers. Uh, so we're an online interagency, intersectoral community of practice, um, <clears throat> focusing especially on engaging displaced communities um, in humanitarian responses. Um, but also engaging any affected communities in general in uh, the, our displacement responses. Uh, we're part of the CCCM cluster, but open to any sector, any, any cluster member, any independent uh, um, uh, humanitarian who wants to learn more about the community engagement. Um, our purpose is to to share our questions and challenges and tools and resources and tips um, so that we can all benefit from, from the hive of, of your brilliant minds on community engagement. Um, um, one of the things that we do is to organize these monthly community coffee and chats where we discuss a specific topic based on requests from community members, the, I mean, the community of practice members, um, who could also be from the affected communities. Um, and this time, um, it is uh, the topic is based on um, a request that I received from my um, colleagues in NRC Yemen. When I talked to them a couple of months ago, and um, um, we talked about some access challenges they have. Um, in the north of Yemen, and uh, which was impeding community engagement. Um, um, I don't really want to say much more about it. I want to hand over to Bandar if he's with us here now. Um, I see him. Bandar, are you able to unmute yourself and, and maybe put on your camera if, if possible? Uh, yes. Hi, welcome. Hi, everyone. And I'm sorry I was late. Not at all. Um, um, can you just um, quickly maybe um, tell us about the challenges that you have um, so we all uh, know what we are to discuss today? Okay, sure. So the, the challenges that we are facing uh, recently in the north area of uh, Yemen, I'm not sure about the south, but in the north, uh, I remember in the, in the beginning of the uh, conflict of the war in Yemen, we were able to uh, have a community uh, uh, meetings, a meeting with the communities in order to select the beneficiaries, in order to know the needs in, in these uh, targeted areas. But uh, I think since uh, 2017 and 18, till up to now, we are not allowed to, especially for the LFS uh, or for the food security projects, we cannot uh, have uh, uh, we cannot have community meetings or meeting with the community representatives, as the authorities are the only uh, channel. <laughs> Sorry, the only channel in providing the beneficiaries list. Uh, although that they, they providing the the beneficiaries list, but we can conduct like hundred uh, percent verification of the list that we receive from the local authorities. But still, we are not. Uh, it's not allowed to meet with the community and listen from the community on what are the needs and uh, mm. what uh, who the beneficiaries would participate or who will benefit from the project. <laughs> Saha, thanks very much. Thank you. So, if you, if you, you want, want more information, else? now this is the main challenge. I think uh, the, the main concern of the local authorities on this, uh, and we cannot also like discuss it like in uh, general meetings, like when organizations or humanitarian partners meet with the with the local authorities, uh, we cannot discuss this and we cannot request like 
uh, and to meet the community. They will they will say like they have representatives in all the districts and sub districts, and whatever we need, they will provide. And uh, whatever the need is in those districts, it they will provide. They will they 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 say also, and I heard it for, for in, in many like meetings like. Uh, if the if the organizations or the humanitarian partners will go to a certain district and will uh, ask the community what are the needs or the priority priorities in this uh, district, they will expect that this organization will respond, will provide the uh, the needed services for this uh, uh, community, and that may uh, create uh, uh, or uh, challenges for this uh, organization or for the local authority as well, because they know the local authority representatives in this district and they will follow up with them. Like, where is that organization who came with you to uh, to our place asking what we need and what uh, what are the gap in this uh, uh, district? And there is no response. So there's some risk involved as well. Um, 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 thanks for summing that up um, very clearly, Bandar. Um, um, uh, and when you reached out to me about this, um, I was thinking back to similar requests that I received working with Iran and Syria colleagues and Ethiopia colleagues. And, and we're thinking this is relevant for many contexts with um, what Sara calls assertive governments. So I contacted Sara, who is uh, an all over access uh, expert. Um, and she's got, um, I was trying to summarize your extensive uh, um, um, experience, Sara. Um, but uh, she's an international aid advisor, uh, researcher and practitioner with the vast geographical experience from all over, specializing in advising on engagement with non-state actors, humanitarian access, negotiations and local governance. And she's worked a lot in uh, hard to reach areas. Um, um, I've talked to Sarah before about the link between community engagement and access. Um, so I wanted to bring in her as an expert to um, help us address this uh, this specific problem. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Sarah. That's OK. That's fine. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to see some of you that I know from other places who work together. Uh, and nice to meet um, the other new faces as well. So yeah, when Kristen and I talked about this over the years, but more recently in the last couple of weeks, um, we we kind of ultimately landed on the uh, on the fact that access and community engagement are both, in a sense, uh, necessary for each other, right? So they they you can sequence them. You can say that you need community engagement. Um, to have trust and to have acceptance, and you need those two elements to then have access. Uh, and then by having access, you have proximity and you have closeness to people. And by having closeness, you have community engagement. So you're back in this concentric circle where they kind of all link to each other. And oui, having. Sorry, yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, so in a sense, they're 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 linked, and and yeah, and when we talk about access, maybe just as a sort of reminder at the beginning of this this, this session, we're talking about sort of two elements of access, right? Like it has a dual definition. We often think about access in in terms of it being just about uh, agencies or organizations' ability to access populations, but it's equally important to recognize that the definition also emphasizes the importance of people's ability to access agency services, um, mm -hmm. its range of services. So when you talk about this duality of access, then you cannot remove it from uh, community engagement. And I think I would say that presence, proximity uh, is a sort of that link between the two, right? So not having access to populations means that your community engagement is ultimately compromised, but also not having community engagement means that ultimately your presence is compromised. So um, I don't want to talk a lot at the beginning because I think the way I understood this, it was going to be more of a question and answer. We're going to have like a facilitated dialogue. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions and then, then yeah, I'll take it from there. 
Um, maybe we can start off with one question that I've already received in advance, and that is, what is invisible um, 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 invisible barriers? What do we mean by invisible barriers? Uh, so I think when it comes to access, and then we can say we can see whether that also applies to community engagement. So there are every I think all organizations at in 2024 have developed their access frameworks, right? Internal access framework rely on interagency access frameworks, but they ultimately boil down to very standard categories, right? Physical access that is impacted by conflict, security, uh, environment, infrastructure, road conditions, etc. Then you have sort of more the um, what, what people now call bureaucratic administrative impediments or the political interference. And this can come in many term, uh, in many forms, right? You have, um, I mean, in, in Yemen, you will probably have MOUs, uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, 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 the sub -appro approval for the projects, uh, directives, uh, verbal, written, uh, and, the, and these sort of kind of influence organizations or try to influence organizations and how they operate, right? Or where they operate or who do they serve? Um, and, and their impact can range from delays to financial implications to having to change the type of programming that you're doing, who you can hire, the visas that you can get, etc. But these all have, are very visible in their sense, right? So whether it's open conflict or um, threats and violence or bureaucratic impediments. I think the flip side of this, and, and we see this impact potentially in some cases populations more than agencies, is the less palpable, the less the, the stuff that we can't really touch and sense and, and measure and potentially not quantity, mm -hmm. quant quantify um, very easily. And and I mean, in places, uh, I don't know if you have anyone that works in Somalia on the call, but in places like Somalia, uh, over the years, people have done a lot of research. Uh, and and have have come up uh, for for a term for it like some some of the invisible barriers kind of boil down to what people call gatekeeping, and and gatekeeping can come in many forms right and it can it can um, basically it means limiting sort of your access limiting the flow of information limiting the amount of services it could be it, it controlling basically resources mm -hmm. in the way they come to the populations, right? So that gatekeeping is not always very quantifiable uh, and it's not always very visible. Uh, but in terms of its implication on, on access, on principled access, I would also potentially maybe take the jump here and say on community engagement is, is, is quite, uh, is potentially equal to all of the physical barriers such as conflict and, and, uh, and violence and, and bureaucratic impediments. So this gatekeep, this, the, the, the sort of the concept of gatekeeping and gatekeepers where the information resources access is controlled by a limited amount of individuals mm -hmm. or entities has, could, could be labeled as an invisible barrier, I guess. But then Sarah, if, are there any questions? Sorry. Um, you can raise your hand or you can... Um right in the chat. Um, uh, Bandar, yes. Thank you. I mean, adding to what I have mentioned also before, it is sometimes the, the barriers are due to the situation, the security situation in the country that make the local authorities make some um, like um, conditions for the, the humanitarian partners uh, in uh, in conducting community engagement or movement or like uh, and also any uh, activity that needs to be conducted in the field uh, and uh, very like uh, a permit need to be obtained from the local authorities before the team move to the field before the team uh, uh, start distributing the humanitarian aid i think it is it is linked to the uh, security situation in the country as well and that is what is happening also in the north of Yemen. Yeah, I think it's always important, maybe just on, on, on Bandar's point, it's always important like to understand that I think very rare, like rarely, uh, particularly in complex uh, responses, do you see one set of, of, uh, 
of access challenges, right? So you can have conflicts coupled with bureaucratic impediments, coupled with gatekeeping. I mean, Somalia is, and disaster. Somalia is the perfect example for this, where you have all of these elements converging with each other. Um, and, and, and they definitely, there are compounding factors. Um, there, are, there are elements that make, for example, gatekeeping worse. So the, the conflict element that you've just mentioned, for example, puts a legitimate barrier on physical access. Uh, and physical access and sorry, remoteness is a compounding factor to gatekeeping. It allows gatekeeping to thrive negatively, right? So all of these sort of elements, they kind of play into each other. I'm wondering, Sarah, if um, if you have any examples from other places where this has been an issue um, and you've been able to negotiate access somehow to engage with the community, whether that is to, you know, be allowed to ask uh, questions that you weren't allowed to ask before or meet with the community without the, the local authorities present or, um, um, yeah, and um, that's my question. And also Eve has a question here. Um, what's the best approach to identify and address these barriers? So I suppose it's a little bit the same question. Um, what can we do? Okay, maybe I take Eve's question first because it's a bit broader. Um, uh, so I think there are so there's the I, there's first identifying the barriers and then there's tackling the barriers. I think that's Kirsten's question. And I think identifying the barriers, they, they for me they're always linked. Like the identification and the analysis is always linked to the management. So I think particularly for gatekeeping. Uh, it's not a it's it's um it's a sort of a multi-layered approach i would say understanding using the tools that you have internally so if your organization carries out internal context analysis or conflict analysis kind of go back to that and try to understand the local dynamics that you're operating within i think for me like the first pillar like the point port of call is understanding the environment you're working in um a lot of the access challenges that we have, we often understand them at the incident rate level. So for example, we have been denied 40 visas for international staff. I think, Tom, you remember the context that I'm referring to. Uh, we have been uh, stopped from, uh, the MOUs have been delayed for X amount of time. I think this is an example that could be very relevant for Yemen. Um, these are very sort of uh, quantitative elements that organizations, NGO forums, access working group will tend to track. I think what would be, these are very helpful for advocacy messaging. These are very helpful to explain the impact and the importance of managing these issues. I think what's important to finding solutions is understanding why. So the, mot the motives, the rationales, I think vendors to vendors point before is trying to understand why these authorities don't want you to engage directly, right? So in, in the example that Bandar gives, he's talking about organizations uh, sorry, authorities being concerned that organizations going to certain places and discussing with communities might raise expectations. Um, and then, so then trying to understand why is this the, 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 um, the sort of the rationales that they're using? Is this because of precedent? Uh, but is this because the district authorities are already in a compromising situation, for example, with the local community where they have also promised and not delivered, uh, and that would also expose them? So I think understanding why the drivers, the root cause of these uh, of the barriers exist, right? Not just quantifying, quantifying them very important, understanding their impact even more important because then you can distill and understand not a very long shopping list of these are all my access problems, but these are the three access problems that cause the most impact on people accessing services and assistance. Or, or um, but these three that you've now prioritized understand why they exist. And I think digging a bit deeper into like the local conflict dynamics and as local as you get, the more you will understand in certain contexts. So I would say understanding as well. So your top three, just to answer Eve's question, and then I've seen other questions come in. Uh, Kristen, you have to stop me because I would tend to speak a lot. So if I'm- No, no, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so the, I would say understanding the, the, the top access barriers that have the most impact 
Then, digging deep at which level these access barriers are existing, do they exist at your local level or is this a national level issue? Is this a community level issue? And then trying to understand why they exist. But before I go into the why, I'm just gonna glance over the questions, negotiations. Da, 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 da. Um, um, if, if you want there, uh, we can uh, ask them to oh, ask him. Uh, <laughs> maybe Tom Perfect. can uh, voice this horrible question in person. Are, are you sure? Do we not just want to avoid the awkward, horrible question because it's awkward and horrible? Okay, so um, we sometimes hear about emergencies where humanitarian principles are broken, often slowly um, in pieces, bit by bit, where one organization crosses a line then another organization goes a bit further, often because they're looking at some short term aim that they have and they're not maybe thinking about the bigger situation. But what this, of course, does is changes the negotiating position for everyone because um, suddenly there's a new uh, precedent has been set and all the, all the partners have to react to that new precedent. Um, do you have any thoughts on how we can reverse that sort of situation where it does start to develop? Um, how we can how can we be more aware of this happening so that we can uh, pounce on it a bit faster? I don't know, um, but I've seen it quite a lot in a lot of different places in many different contexts, um, and it's always really tricky. As is the question, sorry. Great, great question. So it's a question about precedent setting and how do we go back from it? Okay. Um, I think, I mean, ideally, we wouldn't even be there in that situation, but we all know that that is more common than uh, than we'd like to think. I, I I mean, I would like to think, I, think, I saw a question somewhere about coordination, and I think, I would like to think that this is where the role of um, coordinating forums come, whether in the form of NGO forums, civil military coordination groups, or operational working groups, whatever they're calling them, um, or access working groups. Um, I think first there needs to be a recognition that different organization and honesty about the positions that organizations have taken, right? And 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 then when you have sort of an, an, an overview, I guess, of all the positions, then coming back to a common denominator that is acceptable to everyone, operational for everyone, and then making sure that there's an agreement. I mean, often precedents are set not on, on, on specific issues, right? So not just with specific actors, but on specific issues. So let's say a president has been set with authority acts on beneficiary selection in this area, right? So it needs to be as specific as that for us to understand how to roll it back. Um, and then an understanding on why it was like broken in the first place is because there wasn't a coordinated position that came up fast enough, so organizations had to do it. And are we now in a position to go back and say, okay, so now that like the immediate short-term emergency support has been given. Now we have a bit of respite and we can go back and say, okay, now we have time and bandwidth. Can we agree on a common position? But I think the most important thing is that you need a, a common position that is actually tenable for the, for the, for the long-term. Like the common position need to, needs to be something that is acceptable by anyone. And this is where it becomes even harder. I mean, um, I, I think there's a lot of cases where joint operating procedures countries have been tried to put in place and, and I think that requires an entire uh, session on its own to discuss sort of the benefits of having JOPs in place and, and why they work and why they don't work and what makes them work. But I think one of the main things is that engaging, if you actually want tenable positions, then you need to engage your counterparts in this discussion. So the authorities, normally the people that we don't engage with in the beginning to come up with set positions and on, on these issues to understand what is also acceptable for them before we, before we come up with what's a minimum condition for us in that sense it needs to be a negotiated position and i think there have i don't know if anyone on the call was working in syria um, maybe seven eight years ago but there was an attempt on putting together negotiated joint operating positions with the uh parties to the conflict and the north East, I believe, at the time. Um, so, and I think engaging as much as possible with local organizations that also work in these areas and what are their conditions and what have they been doing? Kristen, I'll let you yeah. talk. Um, uh, I, the next question um, 
Uh, I mean, there's there's a couple of questions linked with that, uh, but there's but I can also do it in order. I don't know if you want to um, continue on this topic because um, uh, so Roxandra has a question about um, um, how does CivMil coordination and access working group come in when it comes to granular community engagement issues? And then Yaksan, who's been working on um, uh, from Gaziantep on northern Syria, is asking if you advise communicating and engaging with the community directly to put pressure on the local authorities to allow access. There's two related questions. I, yeah, I'm just to see if I understand your question correctly. You seem, do you mean like having communities negotiate on behalf of NGOs or agencies? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm good. Yeah, I'm in the States now and 6 a.m. So I no, actually no. To use the information, link the information to the local community uh, on delivery, like let's say delivering food baskets or other items. So they put pressure on the local authority to to give you the access, not the negotiating on your behalf. That's clear? One more time, sorry, I didn't get that. Okay, so let's say you wanna deliver a food basket and the local authority asking you not to do so in this area. If you communicate to yeah. and engage the community that I want to deliver, but the local authority will not, is not allowing, I mean, I, I think, my question is, is it a good idea to engage the local community and tell them we wanted to do distribution in the new area, but the local authority is not allowing to have them in the picture to negotiate the access as well? So you would inform your, so this, this would be part of an ongoing discussion you're having with communities and through that discussion you would inform them that the local authorities are the reason why they're not receiving assistance. Exactly. Do you think it's a good idea to get to get the access from the local authorities? I mean I think I would I think it would be highly dependent on on the on the local authority and and how much engagement you've had with them before on this issue and how what's their relationship with like I think what we need to keep in mind when we talk about either the example that Yagzan just given or community-based engagement, I don't know if that's something that's come up, is the power dynamics are quite different between an organization and agency negotiating with an actor and the communities negoti negotiating with an actor. Um, and the principles that would apply to agencies and organizations uh, do not always apply to them, right? So, um, so I think and having a very good understanding of the, which takes me back maybe to the, to the first question as well, of, of the power dynamics that exist in, in an area where you work and whether you would be either putting the, um, either jeopardizing the relationship between you, like your entity and the authority for the, it might, it might lead to like short term gain potentially in a situation like that, but does that have more medium, longer term repercussions on your agency organization's ability to deliver in this area and the trust that you're trying to build with the authorities, that's one hand. And on the second hand, are you given the power dynamics, which I, again, I don't know which area you're talking about, um, uh, like given the power dynamics between the community and the authorities, are you also putting the, the communities at risk in that situation? So I think you need to have a very granular understanding of what this tactic um, might play into local conflict dynamics, but also your longer term presence and ability to serve populations in these areas. And I think maybe this takes me back to like the general on, we talked about understanding the most impactful access challenges. We talked about understanding their root causes. And, on, and then I think the third bit would be understanding how to manage them. And I think for me, I think political economy might sound like a big, very, very fancy word, but then understanding the political economy of access challenges is incredibly important. Uh, what it basically means is like, who is benefiting from putting in place these access challenges, right? And like very plain terms, we can call it whatever it is, but understanding like who is gaining from these access challenges, whether economically, so rent seeking, and this can range from basically forcing you to work with a certain set of acceptable local organizations, to enforcing armed escorts by private security companies who owns the companies, et cetera. So asking yourself these questions. 
to also like the conflict dynamics, clan dynamics, ethnic dynamics, social structures, etc. So I think trying to understand um, these things is very important. And 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 again, like the short termism in humanitarian assistance is dominant for very obvious reasons, right? There are immediate short term needs that need to be met for populations. But then this should be done in mind with very specific time frames, but in a very well, well thought through implications where you weigh the risk and benefits. So in Yaksan's example, like weigh the risk and benefits of this. Like do the do, do the benefits of like, are people going to die tomorrow if you don't deliver these food baskets versus um, are you never going to be able to access this area where there's a camp with, um, uh, I don't know, X amount of people living there that with no presence might be in even more risk if you're no longer allowed to access this camp. I don't know, I'm giving random examples, but but that's what I would like to say. Sarah, I'm going to take you back to, um, to Roxandra to see if um is Alexander, did she answer the question about the granular community engagement issues or um would you like to ask this um and then we have um fernanda and emmy and wafa also have questions hi everyone sure thank you and apologies for some reason my camera doesn't want to switch on um, I'm Ruxandra. I work with the global CCCM cluster, and this is a very interesting topic. Um, as you know, we've been trying to formulate some form of understanding of what remote management is for us for a while, um, and operating in locations where we had previously access and then lost it, or there's fluctuating um, access. So, of course, from the higher perspective in locations such as Iraq, Tom may recall, we used to work a lot with civil uh, coordination to, to um, assess, you know, whether or not we can go into locations, um, even in, in the most basic way. And then um, in Yemen, as colleagues may know, there is an access working group that, that you know, in in all purposes should harmonize an approach of the humanitarian collective but these are very high level discussions and generally cover wide topics that everyone um, in the humanitarian community experiences on our side sectorally for CCCM we are intrinsically connected to the community our work um, stops when the connection with the community doesn't exist so the question is mindful of all of the coordination structures that need to be abided by um, and reported to, to to make sure that all of this is captured correctly um, and practically what are some i mean i don't know if anyone has actually any good examples but what could be some of the practices that we can advise our partners, our organizations to take um, more from a programmatic perspective, Ad again, additionally to them or their senior management um, accessing this co this coordination forum. When you, exactly your, your um, example, when you have camps which today have uh, access, tomorrow don't, and there's, you know, always fighting, there's security threats to the organizations themselves, but the people themselves, are there any practical measures that, you know, maybe examples or literature highlighted that we can draw upon? I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of of uh, of um. So basically, like, how can you use civil coordination groups to improve to improve your ability to access these communities? Just to try and summarize the question. I mean, I think that's rather clear, as in the coordination elements with higher level stakeholders, let's say, is, is yeah, they're there and they're they're functioning, I guess, at their best. But when 
you're a program manager doing yeah. site management really and you've lost access to your camp and you can't work <laughs> to put it simply are there any uh, elements to consider or things that we can draw upon i mean looking at you know advising colleagues which may be in this situation what would you do you have any examples that we can or any ideas really even from the broader community here because i think we're all you know, well experienced in these kind of situations has anything proven useful i mean i i'll, I'll try to answer the question i'm not sure i, I really grasp um the, the nuances that you're mentioning but i think like similarly to i mean trying to look back at iraq as well where different agencies they've lost different access to different sites uh understanding the why the reasons why always and understanding how your your ability to engage with the people that are in charge on site but also the people that are in command and control of these people and i think again understanding where the restriction comes from does the restriction come from the authorities that are your direct um, stakeholder, like your the, the direct people you did liaison with, or is it coming from um, more at the national level or at the regional level? So I think trying to go back and understand where the challenge comes from was at least I think in Iraq the most useful approach that at the time some agencies were taking is is because a lot of the time it it wasn't ultimately about sort of the unit or the commander that was controlling that area. It was about what was happening around in the general conflict uh, and how different actions of different, um, back to Tom's point, I guess, how precedent setting in different sites then caused uh, different requests and demands on organizations that then ultimately had to pull out, right? So I think it's, it's, it's sort of understanding that like this situation is not happening in a vacuum. Um, but it's happening within sort of wider conflicts. So like your sort of like your third dimension and also like on a tactical level, like what's happening with, with other agencies um, and kind of like trying to triangulate between the two. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, I think Dinar had her hand up as well. I'm not um, sure if I'm not sure yeah, if I, think, um, I think Fernanda um, was next in line. If you want to um, um, ask your question, Fernanda. Yes, thank you. Hi, Sarah. Um, great, um, great learnings. Thank you. I took some notes. So I was just wondering about if uh, you have any reflections in terms of, um, of course, varies context by context, but uh, prioritizing perhaps local um, local experts versus versus international experts in certain contexts um, to facilitate and enable. Do you mean? Do you mean uh, like? For them to do the negotiation, for them to do the analysis, yeah. for what? Which which bit of it? No, the negotiations, like negotiations. Front line negotiations. Yeah, I think that's such a good question, and I think there's uh, like so many people have looked at it from from different ways, um, and I think there's a lot to be said for both. I could maybe just present a couple of the arguments. I, I was recently um, talking to colleagues working in Somalia, for example, where uh, a lot of the organizations have employed a dual strategy. And I think that's been the one that's been the most successful um, in, in, in complex countries, where in complex environments where we have uh, different sets of actors to engage with. Um, some are de facto authorities, some are groups, uh, federal level, state level, et cetera. And I think the reason why some of the colleagues that I was speaking to were saying that it's important to have this dual strategy is that you definitely need someone that understands the nuances of the context and the um, uh, and and the, the sort of the local clan dynamics, the, uh, the 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 social dimensions of the conflict, the political dimensions of the conflict, etc. But that doesn't mean that they're the person that that is the only person that should negotiate, right? So what you need is a, is a mixed negotiations team that does an analysis because then you bring in uh, you're you're a far more intelligent team and you're bringing in more more perspectives, right? So I think when we need to think about negotiations, you don't need to think about, or engagement, don't think about the, for me, the last thing, like the profile of the person negotiating is part of the bigger picture. It's a, it's a dimension thing, right? It's, it's the at the table tactic. You're now at the table and you need to decide who should negotiate. I think where local expertise 
brings in so much value in addition to being at the table in some cases is at developing the negotiation strategy at your engagement plan and your understanding this is where you bring in the perspective and the nuances and the, it's not just okay so um i'm an international staff with a senior management position and i'm going to come up with this this is what we want out of the negotiation but i'm going to send my national staff to the table and they're going to negotiate that's not that's not how it should work that's not where you draw on this expertise you draw on this expertise at when you're designing the deal when you're designing the negotiation strategy when you're pitching what is possible what is acceptable what is the best outcome right for the community and that's where you definitely need your local expertise coming to choosing the profile i think here it's super as you were saying context dependent i think in some cases it's impossible to not send a national staff in. and i don't mean national as in they hold the passport right i mean national as in from the community hyper like hyper involved known etc and in some cases is doing that alone is not enough because you would also be exposing this individual what you need is a dual engagement strategy so you'll bring in your um your, your the person for like you, the person on your team who is who fits the right profile for this specific engagement but then you make sure that this specific engagement is done at the right level right so there are the, the person they're talking to their interlocutor is also of a similar level and what you want is you want to cushion this with a more strategic, longer term relationship building exercise uh, at the at the more sort of, I would say, the vertical level, if you want, where you have senior management at the organization speaking to higher level authorities from the, whether they're de facto non-state armed group, government, governors, whoever they are. Right. And I think in this way, you are in countries where we have more and more laws criminalizing engagement with armed groups so there's a tendency in our sector to talk a lot about global counterterrorism laws and sanctions and their impact on humanitarian aid and there's so much work done on that i mean amazing work done on that and lots of lobbying and advocacy done on humanitarian exam exemptions and and carve outs much less and much less discussed and i mean in iraq it was if i remember it was like law number four or something in a constitution that criminalized engagement with certain groups in Somalia there's a recent anti anti laundering anti money laundering law whatever it's called that also and engagement that also criminalizes aid workers um in Myanmar there's also a, a local um law that criminalizes legislation that criminalizes engagement with uh some of the ethnic armed groups for example and these are, this is where you need to think in your risk assessment part of your negotiation strategy what should my negotiation engagement at the level, at the senior level, what are my talking points? What are the points I'm engaging on with government authorities or with the senior level to ensure that whoever I've sent to the negotiation table that is bringing in this local perspective is protected, mm -hmm. that I'm sending them in with enough uh, protection for as an organization from a duty of care perspective, from longer term presence, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. I really wish that we'd booked you for two hours instead of one <laughs> um, um, because we have more questions um, um if that's okay Tara um Emmy you're up next with your question thanks for waiting thank you thank you Kristen thank you Sarah for this very very interesting talk um so I have multiple questions and I'm gonna be try to i'm going to be trying to be structured and you already touched upon um many of the points but um to start with um so in some contexts that we work that are very dynamic people that we need to deal with might uh change over time so meaning like uh, one day you um try to you need you need to deal with the central government and the other day the local government and then they might not get along well but then next day there might be an election and they change but they come to you and say you had good relations with the previous central government and now we, we are we are in power so in those kind of situations um how should we basically manage uh, overall like in in those kind of um contexts um, my second question is Kristen this is something that we recently discussed um going back to the gatekeepers so and going back to where we draw the line 
to be able to engage with the communities, we sometimes need to obviously um, be pragmatic and uh, sometimes uh, um, like break some of the principles maybe we have and where do we draw this line and how we communicate this breaking of principles with externals, but also communities, but also donors and our senior management and even our staff who are on the front line and who face those kind of dilemmas on their um, everyday work. Uh, I hope I was structured enough. So I know there are lots of points, but um, thank you again. <laughs> Let me start with the two questions. <laughs> so uh, I'll start with the second one. I think I think we all strive not to break the principles, right? Like that's uh, that's your starting point. Like you want to operate within what's acceptable. Uh, I think we also have to be very pragmatic and practical about how sometimes the principles are very difficult to uphold in certain situations. Um, but the way I like to think about this, and for those that have worked with me before have probably heard me say this a lot of times, they're not an exact science, right, the principles, but they're a decision-making process. I'd like to think of them as like, so if every single time you have to make a difficult decision, you ask yourself the question of how does this matter impact who I'm supposed to reach and how I'm supposed to reach them? So if we think about the principles as guiding, guiding tools to make two decisions, how do I operate and who do I serve, right? And then every single time you use the principles to make this decision, you will not always have the same answer, right? Because sometimes they contradict each other. If the people that you have to serve means that you have to use the how is going to be outside of your whatever is acceptable for you or preferable, not acceptable, tolerable, then you will not always end up with the same decision, with the same decision. But what's important is that your decision making process is always the same because this is what makes you consistent, right? This is when you can go back and say, we have decided that for this specific case, we will use an armed escort because in every single case we have to use it, we have to make this decision. This is the process that we follow. These are the exact same questions that we answer, and this is how they link to the principles. Because in this case, the principle of impartiality and humanity trumps operational independence because of X, Y, and Z, because the conditions are met. So I think for me, it's a, it's a terrible example, by the way. I think um, very few times the conditions are met for armed escorts, but that's another conversation. Uh, but, but then in a sense, it's a way for you to then go back and say, I have a very clear way of making this decision and I'm consistent, not in my answer, but I'm consistent in my decision making process because this, these environments are highly dynamic and you cannot always be consistent. It's impossible in your answer. What you can be consistent in is the decision making process, who you involve, what questions you answer, and, uh, and, and, and how do you communicate these decisions, right? To your staff that are responsible to implementing these decisions, to your community, to your partners, to the rest of the NGOs, et cetera. And I think for me, that's the most important point is be consistent in your decision-making process. Use the principle as questions to help you make these decisions and not as answers for these decisions. That's on your sec on your first question, the dynamic of our so I think there's easy fixes, institutional memory, intentional processes. So one thing, engagement, I can say this, I've worked with I think enough in, in this engagement access negotiation sphere with different organizations to say this. It's incredibly ad hoc and personality dependent unless someone comes in and is very intentional about their engagement strategy. And by intentional, I mean not just intentional about your really big negotiation with the very exciting armed group. I mean intentional about every tea and coffee and chat and phone call you ask your liaison officer to do, right? It, you need to be very clear from the start on what your objectives are. And then if you have clarity on the objectives of your engagement strategy, then you say, okay, this is an ongoing relationship building effort. 
that is carried out with this entity. The person in this entity might change, which means that you're going to have to reassess where you stand with this entity, whether you are accepted, whether you are rejected, whether they they don't care about you. But then at least your objective is clear. You are clear that you have to engage on a regular basis with the Minister of Interior because X, Y, and Z. Minister comes, minister goes, you're no longer dependent on that person that has the individual relationship with that minister. Also, logs. It's the most boring thing in the world. Have people write down what they're, like, what they, what they're engaging on and when was the last engagement and who's holding that relationship. These are like super easy wins. We, we, upper, we, we work in a sector where the staff turnover is massive, right? If you were a private sector company working in a, working in a, in a let's say, in a, in, a, in a country where it's dynamic and complex as much as it is for us, people stay for longer, right? People who hold the relationship stay for longer. On our end, as much as the, our counterparts are dynamic, you mentioned stakeholders change, there's schools, there's that. Our staff turnover is huge. Right. So at least if you can come, you can't control that. But what you can control is institution memory on engagement. And that is like such an easy win for organizations as well. And you don't need need an Excel sheet that's properly stored and GPDR, whatever data compliant. But you need an you need a you need a you just basically need a log and someone who makes sure that everybody is clear on why they're engaging and what are the objectives. And then because gatekeeping also happens internally, you hire often staff that have great relationships and then they become sort of the gatekeepers of that information from that other actor. They're, your, they're on your team, but they're gatekeeping from the outside. And you need to find ways to overcome internal gatekeeping as well, because organizations tend to hire and mirror images of the societies where we operate, which means that we often could also perpetuate some of the social injustices, by the way. We're, so all of these things kind of come into play when you're engaging and negotiating. And who do you put in charge of these things? Emmy, I, I don't know if I answered your questions. <laughs> you're muted, Emmy, but um, um, she's smiling. Uh, so I'll take it as a yes. Um, um, and I think... Uh, uh, before people have to go, Sarah, um, one thing that we discussed when we were planning this session was uh, whether there are any um, um, any simplified um, tools that you know us community engagers can uh, can use. Because we were, when we were talking about it, we we're talking about different countries, you know, like Yemen, Iran, whatever. Um, and you were saying to me. You know, this seems like they need to have an engagement strategy for how to engage with the government before engaging with the community. You know, like these kind of steps, which steps should we be taking? Which questions should we be asking ourselves um, 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 to develop these engagement strategies? Um, do you have any, uh, any tools that you can share with the forum after this session? Um, that would be great. I think there are so many tools out there. Like I think a lot of the agencies have developed their own tools, right? I would say look out for. I would I would say think of your engagement in three dimensions. One is analytical. Look for a tool that allows you to understand the context, the political economic dynamics. So why do these access constraints exist, right? Like try to most of the tools don't really do that, but try to like add a layer to them. Uh, and, and the conflict, clan dynamics, etc. Try to ask other departments in your organizations. For example, many multi-mandated multi agencies here have, for example, stabilization programs that tend to do like more district profiles or uh, tend to like do conflict analysis. Some some organizations that have a peace building arm also have that as well. So I would say like um, I would say like try to pull internally and then also try to get information from each other, like interagency. So like look for tools that allow you to do if an analysis of the drivers and analysis of the actors both, right? Like what do they want? What do they need? That actor analysis. But don't do it in the sense that these are the actors that are there and that's how they link to each other. Like try to understand what are the motivations and rationale for these for this particular actor to impose. Are they trying to get money out of you? Are they trying to impose authority? Are they just genuinely suspicious of your presence? And then develop the strategy. I think so that's the, the biggest dimension, like understand the operational context you're working in. And the second bit for me is always 
like a systems and processes one, understand your own organization's human resource makeup. How does that impact your engagement? How do the people that you have in place in these positions give you an added advantage or the other way around? Try to understand, I mean, I'm thinking CCCM. Do you, like from the shared feedback mechanisms, right? Can you get enough information to understand better um, some of these challenges? Like, uh, I mean, take the IDP call center in Iraq. That was an incredibly, at least I, I was working mainly on access, but I relied on the information that came out from that so much to understand a bit more as to when I couldn't reach the communities myself, what, what their challenges were and, and as a way to kind of get that community feedback. And I know there's been efforts, at least in Somalia, to have this joint, um, I forgot the name of it, site, I think, or something like that. Yay, I got it right. So proud, CCM people, I need to know like the, <laughs> the lingo. Uh, and then, so like trying to understand your own internal processes as an organization, but also as a sector and how can you work together? And I think finally is the engagement relationship building. Like don't think, don't use tools that just prepare you for the big negotiation, right? It's great that you do negotiations training and that you understand how to do analysis and engagement and choose your deal and all of these things. But think our sector requires long-term engagement strategies that are incredibly intentional with potentially one-off negotiations, constant liaisoning, and longer term relationship building and like look for these things. So I would say try to find a good actor analysis tool that you can use that helps you answer the question why. Try to do a like understand your access barriers, but don't just quantify, understand their impact. Try to find a tool that does that, understand the impact, but then also understand why they exist. And then find or develop a basic Excel sheet. Like the most basic is I try to put in there, log the different engagement that's going on now, get an idea of what's going on, and then what are your objectives, and then mix and, and see what are you missing on that. I don't know, like, because I feel like I could say, yeah, use the, I mean, CCHN, NRC, Mercy Corps, OCHA, IRC, I'm trying to think, I don't want to, I didn't want to list because I know that someone, I'm going to forget someone, everyone's developed a negotiation handbook play tool of some sort. Like the idea is find something that just helps you answer these questions and they all kind of answer parts of it. So you kind of need like a puzzle to do all of these things. You need your, analyt your analytical piece that will guide all of your work. You need to understand the internal makeups of your own organization or your own sector and how can that play to your advantage or disadvantage. And then think of engagement as a longer term thing and not just a short term one big negotiation, but more of a, like a relationship building exercise liaisoning efforts, engagement, and then negotiation on top of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's great. I think for uh, there's not just CCMers in here, but at least for us CCMers, we love to like, you know, visualize in, in diagrams and, and, and drawings. So it's good to have like a three dimensional step by step different. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll, 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 I'll put a pyramid together. And send yeah, it. perfect. And um, that's what we love. Um, um, uh, do you have another five minutes, Sarah? Um, because Wafa had a question as well. I think Wafa uh, also works in Yemen, if she's still on here. Um, yes, I am here. Thank you for Hi, your Wafa. fruitful conversation and sessions. Actually, it is indeed uh, related to what we have here. Uh, actually, um, my question it was is like it goes on with the other uh, like uh, discussions. But um, it's not a question, but it is um, it's like uh, an understanding, a full understanding of uh, what if we uh, it's like uh, led the other it's like executive unit, other parties and local authorities, other stakeholders, by the way, know about our structures and our activities. And then we start it's like supporting other camps with the with what is like support that we have. What do you think? One more time, Wafa, sorry. At the end of the day. Okay, for end. example, if we have, uh, for example, if we have, um, it's like um, a distribution with cash or food in uh, in, uh, in some camps. And then if we have, um, uh, if there is a stakeholders from the uh, executive unit or local authorities who is preventing us from uh, distributing something, uh, what we have to do is like before, we have to let them understand our activities and our target 
and what we are going to do is it is it correct to let them understand the whole process that we are going to to do it or is is not like we have to stop in a, in a, in a point that we do not have to explain so many no i think at least i mean people on the call might have other um also perspectives and my perspective i think a lot comes from being uh, clear about what you're doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that these are gains to be made before the distribution day mm -hmm. so, um, it's like during it's like during the coordination exactly so i think leading up mm -hmm. to that activity you want to do whether it's the distribution or etc i think being clear on and this is where the to Emmy's question before this is where consistency becomes very clear because I mean if it's the same authority that you're engaging with for let's say multiple activities or multiple sites but then in one mm -hmm. case you're telling you're doing this because um like for reasons that are contradictory for why you're doing something else down the line then that would become harmful for you so I think what you need to do is like when you're consistent then you can be very clear and very honest and I think for me like it's if we go back to that to the to the to thinking about engagement trust building acceptance mm -hmm. access proximity for me it's then if i want to like break it out of community talk about access for me it's um consistency acceptance and then access because consistency being mm -hmm. consistent vis -a -vis the communities that you work with vis-a-vis -vis the authorities that you work with is what gains this trust right so making sure that you are consistent and predictable not in the answers but in how you get to these answers and then sharing that information as well with them Okay, so what if we have is like, um, sorry for uh, having long time discussion, but uh, what if we have is like um, an activity related to gender and it's not acceptable for some, it's like uh, in some contexts. Here in Yemen, we have so many. And what we are going to do, changing the title of the, uh, it's like the description of the activity or not doing it at all if there is an, uh, an, an prevention from the other authorities. Oh, I think that's a very, very specific question. And I think I would need to know a lot more about what you're saying for me to be able to give an answer to that. But I think you can look, I mean, in Yemen, you guys have been dealing mm -hmm. with gender based restrictions for, for a while. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of experience um, managing that, um, whether in terms of like travel restrictions on, on women and having them to be accompanied or, or et cetera, or types of programming. So I think it would like, I would say, you need to look at previous experiences and see what's been working. Um, but there's no like there's no ideal, obviously, in the situation. Um, but then I would need to know much more about what you just said for me to be able to answer this. Sorry. It's Ben that has his hand up. I, I have three more minutes. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen. Okay. Maybe we will discuss another time. Definitely. I'll get back to you on that. Happy, happy, happy to have Thank a separate. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much. And Bandar, did you uh, want sorry. to? Sorry, everyone, for yeah. making you late, but just a quick one. I think uh, barrier coordination with the local authorities, it is, uh, I mean, uh, one of the assets of the, the project that need to be done, or one of the main things that need to be done before the, uh, starting the implementation. This is what we, we do in, uh, in in Yemen, especially in the, uh, in the north. Before we, we start implementing the project, we sign some agreement and we agree with the local authorities on the implementation mechanism. And after signing the, the sub agreement with the uh, like the national uh, office of uh, the like uh, the responsible office for uh, for uh, coordination with the um, organizations or humanitarian partners, we conduct another. Uh, like inception meeting with the uh, um, uh, I mean local authorities at the governorate level in order to uh, agree on the implementation mechanism and uh, and before every activity we request uh, like a permit so in order to not uh, face any um, delays or coordinate with the self like uh, a financial service provider in order to distribute cash assistance and the local authorities stop us. So to avoid that, we coordinate with the local authorities before each activity of the project. Thank you. Um, Sarah, according to my watch, you have one minute left with us. I want to um, thank you so, so very much for letting us uh, spend an hour and 10 minutes diving into your 
vast expertise on all of this and ask you a million questions and um, uh, you answer them extremely insightfully and um, yeah, thanks for taking your time and um, and uh, letting us focus on this today. No, thank you. I mean, the questions were all amazing and like there are, it's, there are such difficult situations that everyone here is having to handle. So um, yeah, I, I really hope this was helpful and yeah, please feel free to reach out if you have any more questions or anything. Super helpful. And yeah, we can continue this, um, you know, on, um, on our uh, web platform as well. Um, uh, so we can continue sharing resources and questions and challenges there. Um, Noor, would you be able to share the QR code um, so people can easily access if they don't already have uh, um, access to the forum? Um, thanks again, Sara. Thanks, uh, Banda, for raising uh, the, the question in the first place. And thanks for everyone contributing with their comments and questions and expertise and challenges. Um, we will see you next month. Um, same time, same place. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Sarah, you. Bye. Everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. That's super interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, guys. Tom. Thank you so much. Thanks a million. I can't see the QR code, but I'm presuming if we share it now, we'll be at the end of the recording as well. Ah, okay. So it's a link. It's okay. It's a link in the chat. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Then I'll end the meeting for everyone. Bye now.